Okay, let's let us get started. Um, welcome everyone to the March 2022 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems Advisory Panel. Um, I'm Eitan Ness Redenlonga, the chair, and let us start with introductions. I will go down that list that I have sort of on the right-hand side of the screen. And I will start with a phone number, 342-2468. Um, Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry about that, Aton. I'm on the phone right now. I'll be getting to the computer later. It's Christopher Loris from Crime Research Group and the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. And if you guys don't mind, like to share something, uh, yesterday was the citizenship ceremony for the first Syrian family that got to Rutland in January of 2017. They turned it around in five years. Yay. Lovely. Yeah. Great to hear. Thanks, Chris. Tyler. Good evening, everybody. Tyler Allen, uh, commissioner appointed designee from DCF. And I just wanted to an extend a um, appreciation to all the women on the call today. It is International Women's Day. So thank you so much for your leadership um, and your presence. Great. Susanna. Hi, Susanna Davis, racial equity director for the state. Thank you. Jen Furpo. Uh, Jen Furpo, Vermont Police Academy. Jeff? Jeff? Sorry, sorry about that. Jeffrey Jones, XVSP, and at large. Great. Mark Hughes. Hey, Tom, what's up? Hi. What's up, family? I'm, I am Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and um, I'm still here. <laughs> Good to hear. Aaron Jacobson. Good evening, everybody. Aaron Jacobson, Vermont Attorney General's Office. Great. Jessica? Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Brown. She, her pronouns. I am an at-large appointee to the panel, and I am a visiting professor of criminal law at Vermont Law School. Great. Barb Kessler. Hello, all. Barb Kessler, Vermont State Police, co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing. Thank you. Evan? Evan Meenan from the Vermont Department of State's Attorneys. Great. Elizabeth Morris. Hi, all. Elizabeth Morris, uh, Juvenile Justice Coordinator for DCF. Great. Ching. Hi, Ching Ren. I work at Shelburne Farms, uh, Evaluation and Program Analyst. Also, uh, happy International Women's Day uh, to those on this panel who want to celebrate. Yes. Thank you, Sheila. Hey, everybody. Good evening. And yes, happy Women's International Day. <laughs> boop, boop. I will take that. Thank you. Sheila <laughs> Clinton, she, her, um, appointed by the Attorney General panel member and Executive Director of the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Julio. Leo Thompson, Attorney General's Office. Great. Tracy Nichols. Hi. Um, I'm just here. Hello. I don't know if anybody, well, Sheila's heard of me. And so is Jessica. Hi. I'm just here listening for now at the moment. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's Office. Okay. Monica? 
Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weber, and I'm from the Department of Corrections. Wichi. Hi, everyone. My name is Wichi Artu, pronounced he and his. Happy International Women's Day. I am a data systems expert and social justice advocate appointed by Susanna Davis, director of the Office of Racial Equity. Great. And Judge Zone. Good evening. Tom Zone, Chief Superior Judge. And I would note, Aton, that I looked at the minutes for the last meeting. I was here, but apparently you didn't scroll down far enough to get to the end to ask me if I was here last meeting. But I was there, I promise. Okay. <laughs> well, that will lead us to what I didn't put on the agenda, which would be approval of the minutes. And there's one quest, there's one issue that needs to be addressed. Um, is uh, that Judge Zone was in fact here? Um, are there other uh, errata or uh, additions that people need to make to the minutes? Yes, um, Eitan, I too was here and was named in the minutes, but not named as listed being um, in the meeting. So I too was listed. okay. Very sorry to both of you. Um, I was in we good won't. company, though, so I, I don't mind. <laughs> there it is, right? There it is. That, that okay. was my fault, not Aton. So that's my mea culpa. So um, I will certainly amend the minutes to reflect Judge Zone and Sheila Linton's presence. Sorry about that. Okay. Anything else that anyone has about the minutes from our last meeting? And I would like to just say, Aaron, those are wonderful. I mean, they are so detailed. I was just really happy about that. I know you had issues. You thought maybe they were too detailed. I thought they were lovely. Okay, good. Well, I have to say that I learned a lot at the meeting and then um, drafting the minutes helped cement it for me. And so once I was done with the minutes, I frankly wasn't sure what I could take out. I thought it was all really helpful information that was shared and discussed, so. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So if anyone else has, uh, there are no other corrections or changes that people feel need to be made, a motion may be made at this point. This is Sheila, I'll move to approve the minutes from February 8th. With the corrections, With right? the corrections, with the um, corrections, please, thank you. Okay, seconded, anybody? I'll second. This is Jessica. Great. All in favor, please signify in some fashion. Aye. 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 Great. All opposed? All abstaining? Motion is carried. Minutes are approved with the two corrections. Thank you very much. Um, the for announcements, I wanted there are a couple things that I wanted to do. As first off, um, Chief Stevens cannot be here; he is off visiting family, and he says also trying to reclaim a share of sanity, which I think is a wonderful thing. Um, I'm very <laughs> very pleased with both of those. Um, so he will not be here this evening. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just bring up is that this is probably not going to be one of our longest meetings. Um, as you all know, many of you better than I, it's crossover, which means everybody's attentions are at about 50 different directions at this point. So we're going to get done what we can get done, what has been done this week, uh, I'm sorry, this month and go from there. And I just wanted to put that out there. It's unlikely we're going to go to eight o'clock, but I don't want to have things just sort of hanging around. Um, of course, feel free if you need to. Um, that's what we've got new business for. If you've got something that needs to come up, that's the place in which to bring that. Um, I think that's all I have for announcements. Anyone else? That would be a resounding no. Okay. Um, 
you will recall when I sent out the letter about, well, there were two letters. One had the link and one was just sort of sending you a bunch of information that Evan had just so assiduously gathered about one of the issues that we brought up last month about our future direction having to do with our responsibilities under statute to the police academy and to the criminal justice council. And we will talk about that in a moment. The other things that I didn't, I kept sort of hinting, maybe tantalizingly, that there were a couple of other things, irons in the fire, that uh, I hoped would sort of bear fruit. And the one thing that I really did want to bring up was just an update on H-546, the bill that grew out of our report of November of last year. Um, and I have to turn that one over. Um, I, was, I sort of prevailed upon Executive Director Davis if, <laughs> to see if she would do it. And she very kindly said she would. I've been sort of out of the loop on it. Um, and I'm not quite sure why, but I have been. Um, but in any event, I think there are others of you who are less out of the loop, others of you who are more out of the loop, and I'm just hoping right now to get us all roughly on the same page. So, Susanna, can I turn this over to you? You can. I just don't know if my audio will reliably carry me through. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Okay. So, the update is brief, and... I'll be frank, some of you may have newer intel than I do, but uh, last I checked, which was I think yesterday morning, oh, no, no, let me back up first. Um, just for those who are not sure what this bill is, yes, it is H546, which would create a division of racial justice statistics. Of course, this uh, is the panel that worked on that primarily to create that recommendation. It appears that it is still um, the trajectory that they are likely to put it in the Office of Racial Equity. I know that was a big concern for people in this group. Um, it appears that that remains as they have it, and um, it has left House Judiciary with a unanimous vote uh, of approval. It skipped past House appropriate no House Government Operations uh, when they conducted a straw poll indicating that it would pass in a normal vote. So it made its way to House Appropriations. Um, representatives Christie and Lalonde both appeared numerous times in uh, appropriations to give a walkthrough of the bill and to answer questions for the other members. The chair of appropriations indicated very strong support for the work itself. Um, she particularly noted how pervasive racism in Vermont is and the importance of being able to track, monitor, and then respond to it. So if that's a, if that's an indication of the bill's success in that committee, then there that is. Uh, Representative Lalonde has been asked by other members of the committee to discuss whether and why not the duties of the advice. Oh, the advisory council, the proposed advisory council, which started out at being 18 members and then was up to 20 members, has now been dropped back down to seven real meteoric rise and fall there. Um, and the reason is because there was a lot of discussion about whether every entity that was involved needed to be a sitting member on the advisory council or if we just needed to be able to talk to them regularly. And so they ended up landing at having many of the designated agencies that are state run, having them just designate a liaison to the advisory council, someone we could count on reliably to be participating uh, without having to have a voting seat. So the pa so the advisory council itself now is down to seven members, which includes the six community members with lived experience. That includes the, pers uh, the people with lived experience with substance use or with mental health or with um, negative outcomes for criminal justice in other ways. And there's a seventh, I cannot remember who that is. So that is the advisory council. And so the question came up about whether those duties could be assigned to the existing racial equity advisory panel, which, as you may remember, is the five member advisory panel that was created alongside the executive director of racial equity. 
There were good reasons for and good reasons against, but Representative Lalonde uh, and I both shared the sentiment that it's probably better that it not be rolled into the racial equity advisory panel for numerous reasons, but uh, among them being the ability to provide some level of independence by not giving these duties to a panel that is advisory to the governor. And also um, because the existing racial equity advisory panel has staffing that is pretty much enough to cover its existing duties, but would not be sufficient to cover the added duties. Um, not to mention the level and nature of lived experience that we're looking for for this work is not currently represented on the panel. So we would need to expand the membership to be more inclusive. So it seems like the trajectory is to keep the, pan the advisory commission at seven, to keep the advisory commission separate from the racial equity advisory panel and the staffing the, rec the staffing, this is another big one, um, instead of starting at five staff for the first two years and then whittling down to three, it appears that they're just going for three staff throughout, which is one project, one lead, one project lead, which I think we were referring to as a deputy of some sort, and two analysts. I think one would be a data steward and one would be an analyst, but I'm hoping that the CRG folks here can correct me if I'm wrong about that. That is what I know. And that's fabulous. Thank, that's you. fabulous. Thank you. Questions or comments? Witchy. Hi, I, I apologize that I've been a little MIA, um, but I really appreciate this update and sort of how it's gone through and where we're at. Um, I just have a question. When you say data steward, what does that mean? I don't know, bro. <laughs> there right. is a definition right. for that. I, I, I don't know it. Um, I got one for you. Th that is defined. I don't know. Is, it. is which it defined you, in the what bill? Is, what, what it is is you, you've got organizationally, you got data owners. Those are the business process owners, the, the business unit owners, the folks who, who are you know responsible for getting the work done. The, I'm talking about the directors, the managers. The data stewards, that would be digital services. Data stewards are folks who are actually, they are charged with the oversight of managing those systems in housing those data. So that's typically where you hear data stewards is folks who have responsibility for, you know, providing access and control to the data, uh, providing availability to the data, confidentiality, integrity to the data, uh, protection, um, all of these systems that are associated with it, but they don't necessarily own uh, the processes associated with the access to the data. Uh, in, so, so the business unit actually owns the data. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, in this position of the data steward, where is that definition held? That might be a question for Susana. Uh, that's just background experience. I might be able to dig that up. Just give me a second. I know it's in an email somewhere. Okay, thank you. Susanna, this is Rebecca, or maybe Evan knows or others on this call. You, you said um, last and landed, I saw that, that it was went to House Appropriations Committee right before the legislature broke for town meeting week last week. And this is the critical week, crossover week. And I just saw took a look at House Appropriations agenda for the week, and it does not look like 546 is on the agenda for the week. Do it, does anyone know on this call whether it's it's going on any committee's um, agenda this week? I do not. The money bill, it's got another two weeks. Oh, okay. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Yeah, Mark, I thank just, God you're here. I just searched the um, the schedule of all of the committee meetings that have been 
scheduled or calendared for this week, and it does not look like it's being taken up anytime this week. Okay. I, if there are, oh, Susanna's got, got it. Thank you. Um, if there are concerns, this would be a good time to put them forth because I do think it's certainly possible to get these to both coach and to representative Lalonde. Um, if you don't have them now, but you might have them in the next few days or something, I would encourage you to please shoot me an email or you can speak with them directly. Of course, you don't have to go through me. But that's, I, I just think that that's, Critical. I mean, this, the, the bill has changed from what we recommended. We knew it would. We certainly knew it would. So um, if I, I would say, don't be surprised by that. But if there's something here that is just truly egregiously awful, um, we should get that forward. I'm sorry, Witchy, I just saw you say something, and I... Anyway. So, All right. Other questions? Uh, go ahead, Witchy. So just to clarify, so there's only three positions now out of those five, and that's analyst, PM, and steward? Yes. So who's in charge of building it? That's a good question. So that, that was be, what we had the advisory board for. Uh, well, the, the, yeah, I think what, what I'm struggling is uh, like you still need to you still need the technological platform to house the data. Right. Like you can you can put right. all the data governance you want. You can analyze anything you want. You can, you know, have have a project manager. That's all great. But if you don't have the technology to house the data, you're not you're not analyzing anything. So I don't know if then the duties are then shifted over to ADS, and then if so, are there resources going to ADS to help with that so they can hire a database administrator or engineer? So that's sort of like where like it's it doesn't make sense that if you're building a warehouse and you have and you don't have an engineer to build it. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's a very correct question to ask, and so. Yes. I'm yeah. looking right now at a document and I would share it, but I don't have permission to. So I apologize for having to paint you a word picture instead. But uh -oh. looking at a document that estimates costs, um, this was put together by the Agency of Digital Services and they testified on this in a public hearing. So I'm not completely out of the box here, but the assumptions are that the project manager which would be an ADS staff person, would be needed for 1.5 to two years. So that's the outlook that they're putting for the project manager. A database administrator slash data engineer would also be an ADS person at 0.5 FTE, so a half-time person. Oh, no, wait, that's for de-identified data. If we're using identified data, then that would be 0.75, so a three-quarter time person. Um, project manager is still one full-time regardless. And then 3HC in division. I don't know what that means. It also includes, sorry folks, if I had the technical ability to know what I'm looking at, I would do a better job explaining this. Yeah, and it has um, an allowance for three dashboard licenses, um, which I'm assuming is the total number of people they're anticipating would be accessing this and, and working directly on it. Yeah, that all makes sense to me, and that answers my question. Thank you, Susanna. So again, oh, Mark, go ahead. Is there any definition around um, the term 
um, systemic racial bias and disparities, um, and also did was there a conversation about? I don't remember where the conversation landed on this entity having an expansive responsibility for racial equity data across all social determinants. I was just wondering where that conversation ended, if there's a brief response to that. Yeah, I think there's a piece in the bill that says uh, that the day, that they can request any data that they deem relevant, which I think is where social determinants and other upstream factors comes in. I think the Is first part it? of that question was around. Um, first part of that question was around the nature of the the data. Is saying that the data that they're analyzing and collecting is related to quote systemic racial bias and disparities. And I was just wondering if that was actually defined anywhere. I uh, I can I can take this a little bit. Go um, for it. Yeah, so one of the things that was part of that bill is that advisory panel. And the reason why we have people with flipped experiences is to address those systemic racial biases. So when we talk about data infrastructure and data and like the foundation of data systems and implementing some type of ethical framework to uh, be able to bring about equity, we need to think about the different perspectives of how that data is collected and used, analyzed and than used to make decisions. So by having that advisory panel with folks that, uh, whose data is being collected, whose data is being analyzed, right? With people with lived experiences that, you know, their data is supposed to reflect, that then we're able to address those biases that otherwise wouldn't have been addressed. So it, it, in that kind of sense, the, the advisory panel is supposed to provide an inherent uh, equity lens to that data process. And in addition to that, as the governance uh, comes out, one of the things that we suggested, I don't know if it made it to the bill, but was the toolkit that was given to us about like how to con how to use the data or construct it or create data sheets to be able to have transparency um, and equity practices uh, within the governance uh, data governance structures. And that did not make it into the bill. That I do know. The toolkit did not go in there. Evan? I was just going to add that if the bill passes in its current form, then the Bureau would have the legal authority to engage in rulemaking. And that could be a legal mechanism for the Bureau to answer some of the questions and flush out some of the details that are not answered in the bill itself. So there's some flexibility for the Bureau to engage in these kinds of conversations through that legal mechanism if the bill itself does not end up answering all of these questions and resolving all of these issues. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, as I say, it would be useful if there are objections. I would first of all tell, ask people to take a look at it on the legislative website. And further, if there are major objections, um, I think it would be a good idea to forward those to the sponsors. And you will see who those are if you go to the website. I mean, Representative Lalonde is one, Representative Christie is another, um, Maxine Grad and Hal Colston. Um, I don't think I'm missing anyone. But if uh, this is the time to put things in, I don't know where that will go, but I do know that that was asked. That if there were just moments of real discordance between our intent, that at least letting people know that was important. So I've done my due diligence. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. 
Susanna, thank you. You were you you were you were more involved in that than I was, and I was hoping that uh, you would be able to provide all the information that you did. Thank you. All right, moving on. Um, the to what is in fact written on the agenda. You will recall that last month we spent a lot of time talking about directions for the RDAP, and we formed two informal subcommittees, one being Evan and I, that we were going off to talk about um, our responsibilities, our statutory responsibilities to both the VPA and the Criminal Justice Council. And then there was another subcommittee that is still coming together. Um, that will include, um, when it gets going, uh, Rebecca and Jessica. And that was looking at a lot of things that came up in the report of 2019. Uh, we were talking about amplifications uh, of points that had already been made that in another sense, protecting our work product and pushing some of those ideas through and forward. Um, that, as I say, that subcommittee is getting going still. So tonight, what I what we have is the work that Evan mostly put together with a convers um, from a conversation that he and I and Director Heather Simons had about um, the issue of our responsibilities to those entities that I named. And Evan, would you like to take over at this point and describe where we're at? Because you sent off a lot of wonderful documents that we've been able to look at um, over the last week. Sure, yeah, and, and my intention is not to, to spend a lot of time talking about those documents, it's, it's really just background FYI type stuff. The, uh, the only one that I want to reference in particular is um, our enabling, our RDAP's enabling legislation, which is 3 VSA 168. And um, subsection F outlines the things that we're supposed to be tackling, which are many. And uh, one of them is to make recommendations to the Criminal Justice Council about model trainings for law enforcement officers, including but not limited to trainings on de-escalation and the use of force. And at the last meeting, I explained that the criminal justice process or the Criminal Justice Council was in the process of revisiting its rules which in part address those very issues, um, both the certification requirements and the uh, in-service training requirements for Vermont's law enforcement officers. And I had explained that um, the rules committee had paused that work and was seeking some recommendations from other committees on the council like the Training Advisory Committee um, and the Entrance Testing Committee. And um, as Eitan noted, we had a conversation on, I think it was, oh, dear I think it was February 14th. I think it was, Valentine, it was Valentine's Day. Was uh, it? Okay. It yeah. must have been. You, you don't remember, Eitan? We spent so much time together. I thought it meant something to you. <laughs> Um, but we had a conversation with Heather Simons, who is the executive director of um, of the of the police academy, and she gave us some information that I thought uh, this group might be interested in. Um, she feels, and and I think is is this is this is probably an appropriate thought that it's about time for the academy to try and do a comprehensive review of its current curriculum, both uh, for the certification stage and the in-service stage of, of law enforcement training in Vermont. And on, uh, she has asked the legislature for an appropriation 
to hire a consulting firm to do that type of work. Uh, the appropriation has not come through yet, but if it does, she anticipates going through the state's standard RFP process to try and hire a consultant to engage in this type of uh, this type of review. Um, that's likely going to take a long time because she doesn't even have the appropriation yet. But she was very receptive to the idea that RDAP may be interested in providing some input in that process. For example, um, what types, uh, what type of um, information might want to be included in an RFP, a request for a proposal, like what types of consultants might be good for doing this type of review, what types of subject matter should the consultant be reviewing, um, what type what subject matters should be addressed in any certification process or training and what type of community engagement uh, the council should engage in both during the review and then also when revising the rules regarding what the training requirements are so i think that we have a lot of time to decide if we want to get engaged in this conversation and also if we do how in depth our recommendations should be so i don't necessarily think we even have to answer any of those questions tonight um one helpful thing could be uh, as a potential next step would be to hear from some folks at the police academy to get a better understanding of what the current curriculum looks like how what subjects are covered how much time is spent on each subject and that might help us decide is this one of the tasks that we're supposed to tackle that we want to tackle at this moment in time um and also if we decide to tackle it how far down the rabbit hole do we want to get and how specific would we want to get in any recommendations that we make um so that's pretty much the update for this evening and I'll, wow. I'll do my best to answer any questions if folks have them. Witchy. I feel like I always have some, something to say. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for this for this update, Evan. I, I just sort of had a comment, uh, something that I think could be valuable for you to know. Is that you know when we've had conversation at least here in Wyndham County, we, we did a community safety review, uh, and we talked about sort of what kind of police folk we would we would want. Um, it talked a lot about the escalation tactics, and when I talked to our previous town manager Peter Elwell, uh, he mentioned that you know at some points we we had hired police who were trained and focused on de-escalation. Uh, Ta uh, tactics, but then ended up going to the police academy and just quit right after that because of the culture or the training or whatever. So it might be worth considering, uh, you know, folks who are trying to do police reform, like, I don't know, Mayor, Min uh, the, the mayor of Burlington or, or, you know, Peter Elwell or these people who have been trying to change these systems, like maybe they have insight about that training curriculum or, you know, in the directions that they want to go towards community safety or de-escalation tactics and seeing and seeing what can be dug up there. Yeah, that, would that's it, a that's a great thought. And, you know, I would I mean, I think that we can we can certainly ask anybody we want to come and give us information to help us make a decision about whether we want to tackle this and how and and if there's folks that Folks like that 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 have some insight into the current academy curriculum that aren't embedded in the academy, I'm I'm sure that'd be a very helpful perspective. Would it be convenient and helpful for us to put a list of possible uh, I was gonna call them informants, suddenly going into anthropology here? um together to um get a sense of who we would want to ask uh 
um, I wanted to comment. I'll comment on that, Aton, too. And thanks okay. for giving input. So, I would love to have like a spreadsheet or something to be thinking to understand where people's minds are thinking around this area. I am particularly. I don't know if how physically invested I am, but I am definitely mentally invested in this topic, in terms of in terms of how this is done. And um, as I was reading um, some of the materials that you sent, Evan, I was thinking about like, oh, all the things I've been hearing from either those people I know who either work in the jails or people who have come in and done presentations or what so have you. And in and, and speaking to Witchy's point as well, as part of that community safety um, roundup. And we, I'm feeling like we have to be part of this. And I think we need a broader community. And going back to what we keep on saying is most impacted folks, that I'm very concerned of what an RFP would look like. So I'm really pleased to hear you say um, maybe that we're starting from that point in crafting what that RFP will look like, because I have a feeling that depending on how that RFP is crafted, we'll leave out most people who I would consider valuable for this job. And that may not be always looked at because we keep on saying, well, they don't, they're not in the justice system or they don't know, they don't really know what officers have to go through. So they can't really give feedback on the trainings, right? This is a common thing that's been said in the, on this panel. And so I would like to, um, be able to have an entity that's not just versed in necessarily the criminal justice system, but that is inversed in the connections and relationships with people who are most impacted by the criminal justice system. And for those voices to be uplifted in the RFP proposal so that we can get more of a eclectic or a more of a, I guess in a way, what I would say is grassroots from the bottom up. I, I don't want to see these bougie entities who this is what they do come in and um, basically replicate the same um, things that are going on. So some of the questions that I had, and maybe this is getting into the weeds around this, is um, you know, some of the materials that you sent out talked about, well, best practices of social science research. And I'm like, Hmm, are those really best practices? So I'm just, as I'm not delving into the nitty gritty necessarily of what everything is, there's certain terms such as that that stands out to me that makes me think like, whoa, is that is that um, social science research bedded in white supremacy culture? And are we just perpetuating something because we say that that's what best practices is, but what best practices is, is actually not what's best for us as people. And so I'm interested in teasing out and dismantling a little bit more about what those terms really mean, what those practices really are, how the difference between what is said and what is done. And I think Witchy's point is really valid that this is about um, systems change and about um, um, culture shifting. That if we are not to shift the whole culture, then there's going to be a rub. So for the people who are currently in the academy are not going to be able to be brought up to speed per se, and then there's new people coming in, and then there's just a there's friction, and so we have to invest in this as a cultural shift and as a systems change, and make that as part of the RFP RFP of what we want to have people be working on. Great, thank you, Sheila. Jen. Uh, first, I'd like to say, Sheila, I really appreciate that you brought in. The term shift, the terms of shifting culture. Um, we are often at the police academy directed to or encouraged to add training to base academies, which to the base academy, which really only affects the recruits as they come out. And we have a saying that culture eats training for breakfast. We can take a bright, shiny, eager, lovely young person and turn out a fantastically trained recruit but if their agency culture does not support the training and the attitude that we want them to have it goes away pretty quickly that shine comes off so fast and it kind of breaks your heart when you see it um so i threw in the in the chat something that may be helpful for folks as they're considering what they might like to um to suggest um, I have put a link to our training curriculum summary. This gives all of the topics that are taught during the, the level three academy. 
and how many hours each topic is given. That's as much as I can just throw out there for you right now. Um, I also want to point out that that a level three academy officer is very different than a level two academy officer and both of them are working on the road. So that might also be something that while you're looking around on the academy website, you take a look at the difference between the level two and level three training and the scope of authority of both types of officer. And lastly, I think if you wanted to bring anybody from the academy in to talk about our curriculum, Cindy Taylor Patch would be the best person. She knows this curriculum probably better than anyone, any one of us on staff. Um, and interestingly, there's a fairly good number of us on the academy staff who are non-sworn and have never been police officers. So we are definitely open to information from and input from non-sworn folks as well. And I'll I'll hush up now. Great. Thank well, not great that you're shutting up, but I mean great that you put that out there. Oh, I'm really on my game tonight. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Julio. Julio. Thank you. Um, so um, if, if the the group is interested, um, uh, I'm I'm pretty well acquainted with um, the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Funds Policing Project, which is engaged in a, with a number of cities and, and states um, on training on like training evaluation and reform and community engagement. Um, fairly recently, like in the last, uh, I think it was last two months, <clears throat> she did a training for all of the um, all of the state AGs about how to engage community, um, and um, they deal. Uh, the NAACP uh, LDF deals with a lot of subject matter experts, um, and and if folks are interested, I could connect connect her either to the entire RDAP or to a subcommittee to talk about how to set up our RF, RFP um, or, or ideas to consider, maybe examples of RFPs as well as um, uh, thoughts or um, ideas about uh, community engagement, which is usually like multi-stage. So just let me know if you're interested in that. Great. Thank you, Julio. Sheila. I, again, I don't know if this is an appropriate time to ask or not, but um, since we have some maybe people who might have the answers to the questions, I thought I'd ask them. I, I kind of had a question around this topic around um, hours. Um, what I hear a lot from those who have been through the academy is like, we did those hours. We have four hours of this. We have five hours. Of this. It's very broken down into hours. I've never actually heard it referred to in any other way over the decades of conversations that I've had. So my question is, are we meeting the hours or are we meeting the need or the content? Or is it like, as long as we got the 58 hours, does it matter if you bullshitted it through or not? Or if you got this training or not, as long as you made up, you checked off, you, ch you, che you checked in and you checked out, it feels like that. And I can say that for some people who have been through the academy, they've said it feels like that for them too. Like, yeah, we just had four hours on that poop, 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 whatever. It was like, whatever. And so that's one question I have. And a similar question I have around the hours is, is around complete satisfactory. Like what does, what does the completion of these hours or course or training or whatever it mean? Is there a pass or fail? Is there a grade? Is it you get below a C minus, you got to do it again. Like what does it actually mean? And what do you have to do? And what is the scale rating? Like where's the test? Like who's the grader of whether you pass these things? And is it, what are the words used? Is it mastery? Is it proficiency? Is it A plus? Like I'm very curious to understand what satisfactory completion of these trainings mean and the hourly part as well. Jen. <laughs> I am so excited that you brought up hours versus versus skills. That's another thing, right? So we like right now there is that lovely bill and I can't remember the number that is suggesting that we make 
uh, that they that fair and impartial policing become a 10 hour training and a 10 hour uh, biennial update. We don't hate it because it's more. We hate it because then I, as the person who coordinates that training, has to fill an arbitrary number of hours every other year. I don't get to say, here is this topic that the community and our sub and our training committee has told me is important that officers have expressed a need and get and give them the best possible training to get that out. I then have to I instead have to worry about is it enough hours? Is it too many hours? So we at the academy prefer to train to the competency, train to effectively covering the topic. Um, the whole pivoting to the whole um, how do we how do we grade them? There's a variety of ways, right? Some things are weighted differently than others. Some some things, if you attend the training, you have considered you're considered to have satisfactorily completed the training. Some there are learning assessments, which might be a written test. Um, there might be a scenario. Uh, when we talk about the full time academy, there's assessments at various points um, attached to different training topics. And then there's also um, not just classroom type pen and paper tests, but we have practical scenarios where folks have to go and um, try out these skills, right? I spent uh, a good couple of days this this winter running, throwing a door open and running out, screaming at the recruits that they had to get in there. They had to get in there to see if I could unnerve them force them to run into an unknown and dangerous situation or possibly, hopefully not, decide to shoot me because I was waving my hands with a cell phone in the air. So they get tested with these things um, in a bunch of different ways. I think the reason that you see all of the hours on the curriculum summary I sent you is because we have got a relatively short amount of time um, 18 weeks is a very small amount of time to, to teach somebody how to be an officer. And we have to account for that time. At these, we get these folks up at 6 a.m. We put them to bed at 10. And every minute between, they are either learning, practicing, e eating, or studying. So that's, that's okay. hence the hours. I know there's other hands up, so I'll let people talk. But that's the culture I want to change. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ching and then Rebecca. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the work of Police Academy, but just from a background of education and assessment, and it sounded like uh, you already have assessment system in place. And I'm just wondering if it's it would be helpful to do an inventory of the assessment tools in terms of justice and impartial pol policing and to see if these tools actually meet the need of what we want to assess or evaluate, like the programs, how many hours of program are effective and uh, what the learning outcomes of um, the, the program or the training. And also talking about culture change and back to Sheila's point, and I think one of the tools that we could potentially use is the logic model. And that's what we oftentimes use in um, education settings in, in terms of cultural change and in terms of, you know, if you want to build a sustainable cultural change, it would be useful to um, clarify or specify what we are really trying to change and what um, it would take to create these changes and what uh, we need to do in the next steps. Okay. Thank you, Ching. That was very helpful. Thank you. Rebecca. So I wanted to uh, comment on the enabling language that Evan that was helpful that you provided in the list. I was just looking at it as you were presenting and discussing and the highlighted portions of the RDAPs enabling language. And so far I've heard us focused on sort of the work or thoughts or approaches to addressing that piece of the enabling legislation as to, let me pull it up again here, uh, providing recommendations to the Criminal Justice Council 
as to maybe model training to law enforcement. What caught my eye about the pieces that you highlighted, Evan, sections F, two and three, was that it's actually, I, what was interesting to me was that it was broader, providing recommendations, not just to the Criminal Justice Council, but to the Vermont Bar Association, and not just concerning training or even concerning law enforcement, but um, I'm looking at, um, again, two um, best practices on model trainings, but policies for, again, best practices and policies for judges. I'm skipping over law enforcement because we focused on that, but judges, correctional officers, and attorneys, including prosecutors and public defenders, to recognize and address implicit bias. So I just wanted us, while we're touching down on this particular subsections of the enabling legislation that we don't get um, tunnel visioned just to the council, what was interesting to me is the invitation or actually request that we provide recommendations directly to the Vermont Bar Association. I'm not sure who, if there's anyone on this panel who's also a member of the Vermont Bar Association. But I also wanted to share in this moment that um, I know that uh, the Supreme Court has just, I think, created a commission, and maybe Judge Zone can can talk a little bit about it. But it's 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 directly relevant to the work we're doing with, and it's important for us to know that we have another partner um, by way of, of the creation of a commission from the judiciary on on these overlapping issues. Uh, and so I just wanted to put that out there as we think about it, whether it's in this context of the enabling legislation um, or not. But what I like about this is sort of what Sheila uh, touched upon earlier, not just sort of, well, just the opportunity that we are presented to broadening our, um, our support, supporting groups, broadening um, the messaging to certain community communities and thinking beyond law enforcement. Again, uh, I appreciate Sheila's and others in, uh, point, which is that we need to bring in community voices and, and really not just hear from people within law enforcement, people who have been training law enforcement to just sort of talk to us about the same. I, I like how our process of that data system build, how we really sort of brought that to the beginning of, of of deconstructing and recognizing the implicit um, implicit biases and structural racism that we, comes into play when we just think about old systems in you. And so I, I heard, Sheila, that you said that when we approach this, that we need to be questioning the very terms themselves and, and who we're hearing them from and making sure that we lift up those voices. I just like the fact that the VBA um, is included in here specifically from the legislature and also that they want us to think beyond law enforcement. So questions here are, do we have any direct overlap here in the panel with VBA members? And maybe I don't want to put Judge Zone on the spot, but um, I'm excited to hear about the judiciary's initiation of this commission with overlapping interests in this area. Okay. Let's get back to that, but let, let's, Mark's had his hand up and let's do that and then we'll go back to to where you were, Rebecca. Mark? Thank you. I, I wanted to offer up that, you know, there was some, some of you, you know, quite a, you know, quite a huge evaluation of the Burlington Police Department that happened over this last year with a lot of uh, community engagement uh, from an outfit called CNA. Um, and that report is a, that's publicly available. And I think there's probably about, yeah, maybe 160 recommendations there. And John Murad and us are working through that right now here. And it, so uh, for what it's worth, uh, CNA is out there. They seem to do good, good work. I don't think, uh, I don't think anybody's talking about the quality of the report or the proficiency of the folks who Deliver the services, and I also want to piggyback on uh, what uh, Rebecca said. Hi, Rebecca. Um, wanted to piggyback on what you said about um, the um, just the nature of the work when we start talking about what are what are we actually looking at here. I know um, I don't. I think 
Evan, you know, applauding Ed, Evan for returning to the enabling statute. But I think if there were recommendations made in your report, I, I would recommend that you return to those. Uh, reading from the minority report, I'll refer to it as uh, one of the things specifically to your point, Rebecca, was is that um, uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council and the Bar Association recommendations is, is that the panel, as directed by Title III, 168F2, recommends that the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council and the Vermont Bar Association create in conjunction with stakeholders and develop uh, infrastructure to provide uh, querying and um, training analysis. But then it jumps over to um, some other things there. And I think what I really meant to read is, is the training consoles, um, uh, the, yeah, uh, yeah. So there's the, the infrastructure as well as the, the um, infrastructure to provide querying and trained analysis capabilities for data collection. And then there's also model fairness and diversity policy uh, and systemic racism awareness training. And these are uh, as quoted in Title III, the enabling statute of the racial equity executive director, that's the language used there. Um, states attorney's offices, judges, juvenile justice, uh, DCF, corrections, and also we noted community justice center network, crime victim services, and other uh, justice system contractors. So yeah, definitely to that point. And I think in addition to that, um, another recommendation for the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council um, was to create a framework that will support the collection and use of use of force data in conjunction with existing race data processes, make as a priority the creation of a of model appropriate use of force, de-escalation and cross-cultural awareness policy, and to create and adopt model training, uh, academy, uh, one-time block and in-service appropriate use of force training. So there were some recommendations. Uh, the other one was ensure adequate resources, tools, mandatory wellness, uh, uh, very important wellness uh, maintenance checkups uh, as well. So um, yeah, there there was, and I do believe if I recall correctly that there was some recommendations that may have come out of what I'll refer to as the majority report uh, that came from, the, uh, from you uh, about 18 months later. This one was released as you know, uh, on the 2nd of March uh, in, in uh, 2018. But um, the main point is, is just that, yes, um, the dog, the tail should not wag the dog here. Uh, what really should be happening is, is, as by statute, you know, the hope would be is, is that there would be recommendations coming out from this body, uh, as opposed to the council coming back to this body and saying, hey, this is what we're going to be doing. What do, you, what do you guys think? I think there's already been uh, some stuff that's put out there. Um, Thanks for the time. Uh, I got to get off to um, Bible study. Um, thank you for um, uh, allowing me to speak. And here's the minority report. <clears throat> Bye, Mark. See you later. Um, anyone else? My gut is telling me from listening to all of this that what we need to, Julio's smiling, <laughs> um, which it, my gut is telling me from listening that what we need to do is sort of get a lineup of people to come in and talk with us and to address this body. Now, the uh, that seems fine to me. My other question, though, uh, before doing that concerns... Do we want them just to come in and talk broadly, or do we need to have some focused questions? Because that's where, I mean, I I could go either way on this. Um, I mean, my sense is talking broadly might be good for brainstorming, which is what we're doing right now, and that perhaps we have them back in a more directed capacity later on and then have particular questions that in fact the brainstorming session itself might lead to questions. Um, I'm just throwing this out there to sort of get us going. And the other thing that I wanna put out there is 
I am personally completely, I don't know, jazzed, electrified by Ching's idea that we really need to do an inventory. That is like classic, that is a classic move that needs to happen and it hasn't happened. And I just want to put that out there. That's all. Um, Evan and then Julio. I was uh, I was thinking of the same exact thing as as you, Aton. That maybe the next logical step was to um, think about the folks that we might want to hear from. I'm starting to get the distinct impression that Julio might be one of those people. He seems like he knows a lot about this subject matter and and could help steer us in the right direction. Um, I definitely appreciate Rebecca's point about the um, other portions of the enabling and uh, legislation that talks about attorneys, including prosecutors and public defenders and correctional officers. And my intent certainly was not to leave them leave them out. But, you know, I, I just simply knew that the Criminal Justice Council is going to be engaging in this exercise. And so that was the one component of the enabling legislation where we're not going to have as much control over the timeline. You know, we can dictate, I think, our timeline on the other stuff, but I, I wouldn't want to get behind the eight ball on the, on what the council is doing. So I think your suggestion makes a lot of sense, Aton, and, and I'd be happy if, if people wanted to sort of email either you or me or the two of us suggestions for who we might want to hear from, then we could I put would say together- both of us. Yeah, and we could put together a list and go over the list next meeting and make it make a decision, make a group decision about who we might want to hear from. And I, I, I also like the suggestion of hearing from folks who might provide some insights into what type of inventories the council should do, um, in addition to just what type of people might have thoughts about specific trainings. Um, Right. to both the process folks and the subject matter folks. Ching, is this something that you're interested in pursuing in some, I mean, do you have time for this? I'd be happy to help, but obviously I need to work with someone else who is more familiar with the system. Right, right, okay. Um, and Jen, would that be Cindy? Possibly, um, I would go through um, go through go Heather through the first. Director. Yeah, okay. but I, I okay. think ultimately at the academy, all roads lead to Cindy at some point. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Aaron, can I ask you to just make note of that because I will not remember that I have to do that. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Not a time. Thank well. you. I appreciate it, Rebecca. So I, um, I, I'm going to voice a contrary suggestion than what I'm hearing, which is to start a lineup of speakers who should, we should hear from, because I think that's the cart before the horse. And I say that with the appreciation that we meet once a month for two hours. And I also say that with the appreciation that I'm on that subcommittee that was supposed to uh, uh, come back this month and it just didn't happen. Um, with essentially the relevant reports, including our own, where we actually already landed on recommendations that we thought we had previously worked hard to determine what were our priority subjects, where to go next. And what I'm hearing happening today is we're defaulting to next priority item being related to the council and now we're talking about lining up speakers related to that. My drop down on the enabling legislation was just interesting in terms of seeing how much broader it is. Before we decide by falling in this pattern and taking up the next two months, three months, four months of wonderful speakers on this particular subject, I think we as a panel should step back and be deliberate 
we have previously come up with our reports and wonderful recommendations and maybe we want to scrap them and maybe this is where we want to go but i think we need to vote i think we need to come to an agreement that this is where we need to be or maybe we want to do two or three or four things at the same time um, but i am opposed to sort of going on this trajectory of identifying really interesting people on this one subject because i for one while I recognize the importance of trying to make suggestions to the council on training, it is not, I think, a significant priority for us to be landing on as a priority for this panel. So I'd like us to be deliberate in where we go to next. Can I ask you a question? No. Yeah. We, I thought, had said that we were going to do a multi-pronged approach. Is there a problem with that? That we were going to take on a number of things at the same time. Oh, OK, I, I, I if that's where we've all landed, that's fine. I want to make sure that that um, there's space then if, if that's where we've previously landed to make sure there's room for these others. I know that I part of that subcommittee was trying to come up with all the relevant reports with with recommendations on where where we could go to next. Any one of those recommendations, even working from memory from our previous RDAP report, could uh, we add more than one? So which we ones did. do we want to focus on? Which ones do we want to identify the amazing speakers or whatever? Do we want to do it on subcommittees? I guess um, that is fine. To I, I support a multi pond approach. Um, I just wonder if the panel, if we've landed on which ones. Uh, I don't think we have, but Evan, go ahead. I don't. I think you're right, Rebecca. I don't think we have. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, I was just going to say, maybe, maybe that's the maybe that's the topic of the conversation for our next meeting then, because I, when when we my recollection was. At our last meeting, we kind of talked about how expansive our enabling legislation is. It's a it's a lot of things to try and accomplish for uh, what's basically a volunteer group that meets once a month. Right. And so, um, you know, since Rebecca was going to was going to sort of put some stuff together on what our previous but unfulfilled recommendations were, maybe now that we've had this meeting, if Rebecca can come back at the next meeting and sort of with with her piece of it, then we can really decide what's realistic for us to focus on right now. Because if we take on too much, that could be, you know, not that we want to ignore things we're supposed to do, but we, I think we do have to be aware of not taking on too much and getting our priorities in, in order. So maybe, maybe that's what we talk about next meeting. Which of all of these then, things we really want to focus on? Okay. Then I would say let's just hold that back in terms of the speakers, but wait until we hear from Rebecca and Jessica um, and their work. By then it'll be oh, after crossover, thank God. And um, we can have a more full conversation at that point. I don't think, Evan, to your point about moving and not getting behind what the council's doing. I say this with great respect. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, I think we're fine on that front. Um, so should we just wait then until after next meeting to go further down this path that we were sort of proposing? Maybe we won't go there. That was vaguely a question, but. <laughs> Eitan, I'll vaguely answer to which, whichever. Um, <laughs> at the very least, maybe we can all review our own the RDAP report because those recommendations are there. Um, I'll work with whomever, Jess, and, and maybe Suzanne, if you're, if you're interested still in working with us, we can pull it together in a, in a more comprehensive fashion. If any, right. any of you who are not on that, Subcommittee are, are, are subsequently interested, just let me know. Or if you have some reports <clears throat> that you would like us to consider and put into this group and, and, and that's all you want to be involved in, I'd love that. So so um, we'll go from there. But 
if we just review our own reports, there, there were a number of suggestions even there. Um, yes. Julio. So, you know, I put in uh, an offer to suggestion if people were interested in talking to someone, I wouldn't characterize uh, Puneet Chima as an exciting speaker, although I think she's a good speaker. Um, th there have be been people working on the issues that we're talking about today, not in the wake of George Floyd, um, but in, in the wake of, say, Freddie Gray back in 2015. So people who have been doing work that's RDEP parallel, if not RDEP adjacent for seven years, and who may have ideas about how to begin to begin to discuss about looking at the issues that are within the RDAPs, um, th their recommendations from their initial report. Um, I didn't mean to suggest that uh, LDF would be available only once. And um, I think that uh, having, having worked with LDF on different, uh, different jurisdictions or helping jurisdictions connect with them, such as Dallas, for example, they're very involved with Dallas. They're there for a, an extended period of time. Um, and so um, that's fine. I'm not on the RDAP. Aaron is the AG representative on the RDAP. I'm just here because I've been following the RDAP's work and I and briefly substituted in when Dave Scher had left and, and we were transitioning uh to our to to aaron's membership of the panel um i haven't heard from rebecca what if she has any thoughts now about what her priority is if it's not training oriented because i would i would definitely not want the discussion tonight to crowd out a discussion of that so i don't know if you're able to to articulate that rebecca because i do think that um having seen this work in other cities um, doing one meeting every couple of months is not really the pace. Usually there's subcommittee work as as we've been doing. So I just wanted to give the floor back to Rebecca if there were other issues she, based on at least her reading or thinking to date, because I, I did I don't think I heard that and I want to make sure there was space for that. Oh yeah. Thanks, Julio. I know that Aaron, you've been raised in here and I can wait to respond to Julio. Go ahead. You've been waiting. Go ahead and respond, Rebecca. It just makes more logical sense. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. I'll be quick. I think Julio, the the quick answer is is I'll defer until we get the 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 work of that subcommittee all together because my my the process of that was uh, going to be an exercise not just of getting us the handy links to the reports that we already. Um, you know, some of us authored, edited, weighed in on heavily, right? And so dimly in our memory banks, um, not just that, but that it was going to be a, provide an opportunity to see what's come out since then um, as far as recommendations and see what we could add that we had, that hadn't been on our radar. So, you know, it's a little bit premature for me, um, but I will absolutely share. But I think next month is great. Thanks. Aaron. Um, I had a related question for you, Rebecca, so that's why I wanted you to be able to respond <laughs> first. Well, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page in that I think, if I'm recalling right, that at last month's meeting, we talked about um, in the enabling legislation items number 6A and 6B and 6C. Um, those are the items that we are directed by statute to report on and that we all felt like we had um we've done data so yeah we're done with data we are <laughs> i'm sorry no hey, done data data we, we spent we've spent a lot of time on 6c the data provision and that maybe we need to look at 6a and b and that that's what um rebecca and jessica and maybe susanna would be kind of thinking about in the context of past reports that was one thing. And then the other thing was um, the training element for, um, and specifically with the um, Criminal Justice Council. And so aren't we still just in a place where we're trying to figure out what our priorities are? And we definitely have this opportunity with the Criminal Justice Council, but 
it's sounding to me like we have more time than we thought we did as of last month. Um, we have a lot more information about what their timeline is looking like. Um, and so I, I support this idea that Rebecca and Jessica and Susanna and whoever else could come back next month and talk about what, you know, what other priorities we might want to um, lean on for our future work. So I just wanted to, that sounds like a statement, but I just want to, it's more of a question to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then um, asterisk, uh, Julio, <laughs> we have to do everything in our power to keep Julio on this panel. I am no replacement for Julio. He is not only a criminal, or especially police reform expert in Vermont, but nationally. And if we're going to be working on these issues, um, it would really be beneficial to us to, to keep him involved. So. You're not, please don't try to squirrel out of anything, Julio. <laughs> oh boy, Rebecca. I second the uh, encouragement that Julio, you, you keep coming to these panels. You're, you're a great asset and um, great resource. And it's great to have everyone who's who's here and dropping in either for the first time or to just keep coming back because just having this, this exchange. And, and if you're new, this panel, um, you should know that we really do hope to create a, an environment where you feel free to share your thoughts, um, whether it's through Aton's agenda or through this, this, these kinds of back and forth. Aaron, to your point or question of clarification, it's true. I think that our approach, our subcommittee's approach was to think broadly to interpret the 6B broadly, because as Aton said, we're not touching data. We're not necessarily limited to the dealing with the public complaint process either of A. It is reading into six, providing as part of a, the report recommendations to address systemic implicit bias in these two systems, including whether and how to prohibit racial profiling. To us, that's a pretty broad mandate. And as Evan said, I mean, it's, it's broadly written throughout. If you recall, perhaps, I don't know if it was CSG talking to us or CSG talking in another forum, CSG, I think, helped suggest this language and deliberately chose broad language. <laughs> and I have heard at least some members of the House Judiciary Committee, and I'm thinking, you know, Representatives Lalonde and uh, Christie, that they sort of love that about seen the work that that they're not wanting us to feel restricted. And so I think with that spirit, Erin, um, our subcommittee is sort of trying to look up from our last report and not want to miss all the creative, creative reform um, movements and ideas that have happened the past year and a half since we've written that report. Um, and it's not limited to training, not limited to, uh, to complaint processes, not limited to data, but Great. everything Thank else you. potentially. <laughs> part of part of my interest is as the minutes taker, also <laughs> making sure yeah. it's clear it's clear what we're what we're doing next, and then I'm articulating that accurately. So thank you. The only thing I'm just going to jump in, Julio, just before you, just give me one. The one thing I want to. Um, I don't want to lose these little, what I would think of as gems that have come out. I am so powerfully swayed by what Ching said. I mean, I really believe those inventories are critical. So even if that's not the only direction we go in, it came up tonight. I think it should happen at some point. Um, I think it's something we shouldn't lose sight of. And that's, I think I'm talking in some ways to you, Aaron, um, that I just think that that's an important, those little gems, even if we're not going to pursue this as avidly right now and single-mindedly to the exclusion of other things as we might have been 25 minutes ago, I would just really like to keep those in play. I agree. Yeah. And I've noted down in a couple of places that this idea about inventorying and its connection to not just uh, curriculum changes, but um, culture shifts. And that right. seems to be an important theme that um, has come through this tonight's meeting. Exactly.
Thank you. Julio, I'm sorry, your turn now. <laughs> You're the chair and I'm just I'm I'm just watching the the, the panel work. Um so no apologies necessary. I I would say that there is two sides of the coin about timing. It is true that in Vermont, there is plenty of time, at least it appears with the council, but I'd also um, ask folks to think about beyond Vermont for a second. So there are 18,000 police agencies in the country. Uh, most of them have been following what's been going on in Minneapolis, not only in terms of the conviction of um, uh, you know, for the murder trial, but also uh, last week, the trial and convictions of the officers who failed to intervene. I can tell you that when you're talking about RFPs for the right people or the experts and and looking at policing, there is already a very long line of jurisdictions who are looking for the same people that with who have experience and 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 training and um and, and and maybe a track record of how their training works and so while in, internally in vermont the internal mechanism has time to think and to meet and deliberate i i would just point out that um proceeding with with you know um due speed is in vermont's interest because People are, I, I had conversations earlier this week with Heather Simons about a training mod module or model that they want to, that they're interested in, in, uh, in officer peer intervention out of Georgetown Law School. Um, Able. Able, which they are um, at the end of a very, very long line um, after officers were convicted in Minneapolis of failing to intervene. So um there is still enough time but i don't think in terms of looking at people who have a track record and experience uh and people who work with other communities not not i'm not talking about people who just work with police departments we're talking about community driven developed training um the, those there's a long line already forming and so it, i would just counsel um, speed and for for subcommittees and I'm not on any committee because I'm no longer no longer on the art yet but I would just say I would just remind you of that that there are people who are booked mo many months out and I know the academy right now wants to get this training and the people out of the Georgetown training which is free by the way have said they're overwhelmed but yes you can get in line Julio, let me get very specific then. Is there a problem if somebody at the at this meeting were to say, let us sit on this, um, that yes, we need to do this and we need to move on it, but let's think about that towards the end of next meeting, which will be on the 12th of April. Does that make a, does that handicap us? Um, you know, or is the candid, answer it handicaps us by a month? <laughs> that's right, because there are people signing up every day. I think that, like, when I offered to connect folks to the LDF, it doesn't have to be the full RDAP. It can be if that's what the RDAP wants to do. But any individual who's working on any of these projects um, probably could schedule something, at least a phone call, an introduction, a talk with you know, just for a quick brainstorming um, with the LDF folks who work and just say, have you thought about this or that? Or to hear your ideas and react to them because they, they've they been doing this for years. And um, the good news for everyone is that um, there are lots of Sheila's and there are lots of Susanna's and there are lots of Rebecca's and there are lots of Aton's out there around the country. And the challenge is that you don't have access to them. And there are people who have met all those Aton's and Rebecca's and have gotten some of their ideas and they're they're open to new ideas and they're and that's what they get paid for. Is so like to meet those people and engage with them. And it's a much more efficient way to get an idea about what other um, 
projects or I, you know, or or um, approaches that people who have, who have had two years advance of thinking on this have. Uh, and it doesn't mean that our own original thoughts don't uh, contribute to that. But to me, it's just like an opportunity to it, it's like to be able to get, um, you know, a, a much quicker start on a lot of thinking um, because there are many hundreds of RDAP like RDAP like groups, whether they're legislated or not, whether they're based in state government versus cities, and a lot of good people um, have gone through the process. And it, it only uh, I think it only helps the RDAP to get a benefit on some of that thinking. I offered some links for things for people to read, but I, what I, what I could also just make the introduction and then people talk amongst themselves to to people who work on this every single day because all of us i mean virtually all of us uh maybe not all but many of us we have day jobs but there are like you know the person at ldf that's their full-time job is like engaging with communities on these same issues and not getting the law enforcement centered voice but getting the community you know the community voice in there as a as an equal partner in public safety and public health so that that's what i'm that's 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 what's available well, then, to the R rdap if, if if they want it why don't we just keep going the way we've been going but the i mean evan if you're willing and anybody else who wants to jump on in here um on this on the, you know that topic that we were working on um the trainings and stuff that we we pursue trying to have a conversation with some of Julio's contacts outside of the state and Rebecca and Susanna and Jessica work on their stuff and we just do another presentation in a month. I mean, we said last month we were going to do a multi pronged approach. And that was the idea of these two subcommittees. So I guess there's a part of me thinking, all right, fine, so let's just keep going. We did some really excellent brainstorming tonight, but let's just keep moving with this. Because I think Julio's point is actually well taken. Aaron? Thanks. This is a question for the group. Considering how in demand some of the speakers might be that we would want to invite, should should we be thinking more broadly than inviting just RDAP people? I mean, if if are there others that we would really want to invite to the table to hear and ask questions and learn from the speakers? I mean, I, how many times can we get these people to talk to RDAP and then, oh, can you please come talk to the Criminal Justice Council? And then could you talk to so-and-so? Yeah. And so I just, I don't have an answer to that question, but I, I think if, you know, as we're thinking about in, inviting national experts to come help us out, we should think maybe more broadly beyond just this group um, so as to maximize the effect of, of that knowledge. As Sheila would point out, sure. Jing. Um, this is a more um, of a follow-up question. And I, I'm i not entirely sure. So do we have community liaisons that we work with in the state? I, probably there are some people on the panel who are already like community liaisons. But um, I wonder, yeah, at least we should invite people who will be working with um, to represent the communities. And because Vermont is in some ways a unique uh, place. And uh, so if we have outstate person, it'd be beneficial for, for community organizations or liaisons that we will be working with um, to have hold conversations with them to uh, maybe do comparison or brainstorm what um, we can, how we can tap into their brain to, to provide um, information for Vermont's specific work. Yeah. Hmm.
That's a good point. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I guess I would recommend we keep going forward where the way we've been going. I'm not entirely comfortable with that because I hate it when I feel like there is a time deadline and I don't know what it is. Um, that's not a very comfortable feeling. But it is what is. The one thing I do feel certain about is I'm looking forward to hearing what the other subcommittee has to put forward. Because I think that'll help us um, focus, frankly. Evan, if I said to you, where do we go now, what would you say? I would say I'm not entirely sure. Um, I was I was in the middle of typing myself a note that was going to say, think about scheduling a time to talk with Aton and Julio about what the heck we're going to do between now and our next meeting, or is there anything we need to do between now and our next meeting? Because I, I, I just, I'm, I, you know, great. I want to be realistic in... I, I, I don't this, you know, this is a very large group and I don't want a very small number of people tackling these issues that that this group that's supposed to have a lot of voices are supposed to yes. weigh in on, you know, and so it, for better or worse, due to the breadth of our enabling legislation, we do have to set priorities and I don't want to be in the position of being one of the few people that sets them for the entire group. I think we need to I do think Rebecca is right that we need to try and have some consensus on it. But I want to remain being helpful to the degree I can and and do my part. So I don't know where we go from here, <laughs> I guess. I would, well, I think what I'm going to suggest, because I mean, your point is well taken. One of the things that worked well, I think, last month was that people leapt in as they saw fit. I mean, initially it was like it was Rebecca and then and then Jessica and Susanna are now part of it. And I mean, I don't think that it's a closed club by any means. It's a question of I mean, I I, I don't think I mean, we can't tell people to do something. If you want to be part of something, I'm going to assume that everybody can just sort of say, I want to be part of this. Nobody's a mind reader, so no one's going to know unless somebody says something. And I think we have to just take that as, I mean, that's just a logistical fact of having a panel of this size, is that people have to vote themselves onto these things and decide that they're going to work on them. Hey, Tom, for what it's worth, uh, this is Rebecca. I anticipate with our subcommittee, we'll bring a bunch of ideas forward and then we'll see if what what people are interested in and maybe they'll result in subcommittees, a formal vote or, or, a, or a consensus building yeah. around certain topics. And maybe the next move at this moment is um, a motion to adjourn. Do I do that? <laughs> I think others that... I would like to move. On. Yes, I think that we've got the. I, I think we have a direction here, um, but not adjourn yet. I want to um, uh, before we get their new business. New business. Things you'd like to see on the agenda for next month. And that's not a closed thing. I mean, you know, send me a note. It's not like I'm that hard to find. Anybody? Okay. Then, moving right along here, our next meeting, I wrote this, I don't know what happened to me. 
Our next meeting is actually the 12th of April. All right. I don't know why I wrote 8 March. Don't ask questions. Um, but it is actually the 12th of April, 6 to 8 p.m. Again, it'll be on Teams. Um, and now, if someone like Ms. Turner would like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Eitan, before you do that, this is Sheila. I'm just wondering if um, the difference between new business and open to public comment, it might be a little bit different for people who are not used to these meetings. And so if you could invite um, open comments now, um, because somebody might think new business is different from being able to openly comment on whatever went on today or other stuff that they have going on. So, and maybe it's still the same silence, but if you could welcome that into the space, I'd appreciate that. Uh, does anyone have op uh, commentary they'd like to add? Please, those of you who are guests, uh, please feel free to add on it. I mean, chime in. Okay. Hearing none. Uh, would someone like to make, is that okay, Sheila? Thank you, Aton. You're welcome. Would someone like to make a motion for adjournment? I'll make a motion to adjourn tonight. Okay, anyone seconding? Rebecca is seconding, I think, yes. All in favor, scream. Aye. 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 All opposed, all abstaining. We are adjourned. I will see you all on the 12th of April, and I'm sure we'll be talking between now and then. Thank you all, this was really productive. We got a lot of good ideas out that probably we're about three, maybe three months ahead of their time, but I feel good about that. Um, we're thinking forward. That's good. So thank you. Thanks, everyone.